皆様こんにちは本日はイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッション第二日目にご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございます間もなく開始のお時間となりますが先立ちましてのご案内です本日はオンラインの開催となります途中通信環境によっては映像や音声の乱れが生じることがございますご了承の上ご参加いただきますようお願い申し上げますそれでは今しばらくお待ちくださいませ帝国となりましたのでただいまよりイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッション第2日目を開催いたします昨日より引き続きまして本日の司会を務めさせていただきます船木孝子と申しますどうぞよろしくお願いいたします今回のイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションでは中日イスラエル大使館との共催により現地イスラエルとライブで結びイスラエル政府や日本企業のイスラエル現地法人の講演イスラエル企業との交流マッチングなどのバーチャルなミッション体験を通して皆様のイスラエル企業との協業連携による新事業展開などをご支援いたします。ここでご参加の皆様にご連絡とお願いがございます。本ミッションでの講演者へのご質問につきましては、ズーム画面下の Q&A からご質問いただけます。日本人の方には日本語で、イスラエル企業の講演には英語でご記入ください。ご質問はできるだけ各社のプレゼンテーションの途中または直後にお願いいたしますまたどの企業へのご質問かも合わせてご記入くださいなおお時間の関係上すべてのご質問にお答えできない場合がございます何卒ご了承ください最後に本ウェビナーでは同時通訳をご利用いただけますズーム画面下の地球の形のボタンから言語の選択ができます日本語と英語のどちらかをお選びくださいまた講演者のそのままのサウンドを希望される場合は通訳機能をオフにしてご参加ください皆様お待たせいたしましたまずはじめに本日第2日目のミッション開催にあたり本ミッションの副団長であります株式会社成功電気製作所代表取締役会長土屋直則様よりご挨拶をいただきますそれでは土屋様よろしくお願いいたしますはい、えー、皆様こんにちは、えー、ただいまご紹介いただきました副団長を仰せつかっております成功電気土屋と申しますえー、本日は大変お忙しい中
このイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションの第2日目にご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございますイスラエル大使館およびイスラエルの当局の多大なご支援ご協力によりましてオンラインでの視察現地イスラエルの事業環境そして昨日の5社に引き続いて本日は6社のプレゼンテーションをしていただくということでそのさらに登壇企業とのビジネスマッチングまで行うという、まあ、画期的なプログラムが実現しております、えー、皆様のご尽力に深く感謝申し上げたいと思いますさて私ども成功電気製作所とイスラエルとの関わりでございますが1998年に確立した技術を持つベンチャー企業への投資ファンドイスラエルインターナショナルファンド2というのがございましてこれに参加したのが始まりでございます、まあ、これは単なる投資ではなくて日本企業とファンドの投資先の先端技術を持つさまざまなベンチャー企業、まあ、そういったとことのマッチングも目指したものでございました結果としては投資期間中に IT バブルの崩壊などがありまして十分なリターンはありませんでしたけれどもおかげさまでさまざまなベンチャー企業との出会いがあり私どもの新規事業や新技術開発のパートナーとして役立ってくれております現在当社の子会社成功 IT ソリューションがウェブ配信をしております英語学習サイト「学びランド」はイスラエルのエド,ソフトエドソフト社との協業によるものでございまして2002年から展開しております大学や高校企業など多数ご利用いただいておりますその他ユニークな技術による電力安定化製品あるいはエネルギー貯蔵装置といったようなそういった事業との協業実績あるいは現在検討中のものもございます、えー、百分一見にしかずと申しますけれども私も20年前にイスラエルを訪問いたしましてファンドの投資先やユニークな技術を持つ企業テクニオン工科大学インキュベーターなど多くのベンチャー企業関係者と直接交流することができました日本にはないすさまじいまでの国を挙げてのアントレナーシップに大変大きな衝撃を受けましたイスラエルとの交流協業は当社グループの事業発展に大きなチャレンジや示唆を与えてくれたと思います、まあ、今回は残念ながらリアルではなくウェブになりますけれどもぜひ活発な総合交流をしていただきまして今後の事業展開の足がかりにあるいは新しい取り組みの参考になることを記念いたしております近い将来コロナ感染が収束した暁にはぜひリアルでイスラエルを訪問しより具体的な事業を模索できればと思っております本日はどうぞよろしくお願いいたします。皆様ありがとうございました。続きまして、現地イスラエルよりご講演いただきます。お話しいただきますのは、安川ヨーロッパテクノロジー代表取締役社長、アリク・ダン様です。安川電機のイスラエル事業の概要などについてお話しいただきます。現地は朝の8時半過ぎでございます。おはようございます。ダン様、よろしくお願いいたします。おはようございます。えっ、ー、と、ダンと申しますが、えー、よろしくお願いします。皆さん、えー、sorry、I will move to English if you hear me. Uh, and share my、uh, presentation. So,、uh,
Just a second, please. Okay. So my name is Arik Dan. Uh, to one word about my background. I am a graduate of the Israeli military 8200 intelligence unit. And then I did uh, aerospace and aeronautical engineering in the Technion and participated in the IAI, Israel Aircraft Industry Development uh, Project of uh, Lavi Sentoki, a fighter airplane. In the 1990s, I joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was sent to Japan, studied two years at Keo Daigaku, Keo University, uh, did MBA course, and then joined the embassy as a political, economic, and information officer. Uh, spent six and a half years with my family in Japan and came back in 1996, joined the high-tech industry, semiconductor industry, and then uh, medical <clears throat> and so on. And in 2001, I joined the Eskawa uh, in Israel and uh, we started uh, this beautiful venture of Yaskawa Europe technology in Israel. I became the president and during the last 25 years, I managed uh, this company. I would like to share my experience and also the lessons we can learn from Yaskawa uh, investment in Israel. So let me share uh, the presentation. Okay. So first of all, a few words about uh, Yaskawa. Yaskawa is a <clears throat> traditional Japanese company. Uh, I'm gonna say, uh, is a Japanese company established in 1915, started in the 19th century as a coal uh, digging uh, company in Japan and then uh, following the Meiji uh, rev uh, 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 revolution or uh, reform uh, in Japan, in 1915, uh, Yasukawa, the, the owner of the company, uh, started a technology uh, um, development company and uh, started developing electric motors in 1915. Then along the years from 1915 until today, the development of electrical motors, servo motors, drive uh, controllers, and then in the 70s, uh, robots, basically for Toyota at the beginning, uh, 1997, first robots, and until today, um, covering technologies for the motion control and robotics, and becoming number one robotics and motion control company in the world. So if you look at here, you can see we are 14,500 uh, employees, about 500,000 robots worldwide installed, 30 million controllers, uh, 20 million servo motors and motors. These are the building blocks of automatic machines. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, the companies that we installed our products from Coca-Cola to Intel to many, many others uh, globally. Very strong company. Company is um, the company is uh, traded in Japan in the stock market and in Nasdaq in the United States. If you move to Yaskawa a global operation, then from the production uh, the production lines, what we can see is that Yaskawa is in 28 locations globally, 
started in Japan in Kitakyushu and uh, in Iruma, Saitama, but then uh, started developing the production facilities globally. You can see that in China, we have uh, seven facilities, production facilities in China, because it's a very growing uh, market. Uh, and of course, we have in, in Europe, in Slovenia, uh, in the United States and in South America. In terms of sales and marketing, we are located globally uh, in the big markets uh, in, in, South, in North America, South America, in Europe, and of course in Asia in the big markets. So the areas Yaskawa is focused on is motion control, uh, servo motors and drive and so on, uh, inverters, which, is, uh, which are the controllers for many applications from elevators to conveyors to energy, clean energy, uh, robotics, all pro uh, robotics for production, uh, in all application, if it is the car industry, the glass industry, the metal industry, uh, the food industry, all industries globally. And of course, system engineering, where we offer total solutions. I have a short uh, video about uh, Yaskawa. Let, let us see if it is working. This is two minutes, we can see. You might have seen videos like this before, but here's the big secret. Anyone can make one of these videos in a few minutes. Smart devices are everywhere around us. They make our lives easier, safer, and more connected. As devices become smarter, the need for powerful and reliable devices such as processors and cameras is growing. The Japanese giant Yaskawa Electric Corporation provides the most advanced automation solutions in the electronics and semiconductor industry. Using Yaskawa inside, in process, testing or meteorology tools guarantees best performance, reliability and accuracy for many years to come. When you design your next platform, with over a hundred years of experience and many revolutionary technological innovations, Yaskawa is the world's leading automation and robotics company. Along with the classic industrial robotic solutions, can you check your video setting? motors and drives, Yaskawa also offers state-of-the-art technology solutions for the semiconductor industry with excellence in precision, reliability, and high quality. Yaskawa's EFEM offers a comprehensive end-to-end -end manufacturing solution which sets new standards of accuracy and reliability. EFEM excels in high production output, exceptional efficiency, cost-effective and customized product for your needs by integrating various products from Yaskawa's catalog and precise tailoring to customers' needs in the shortest time to market. Yaskawa Semistar Gecko is a cutting-edge technology robot enabling super-low vibration transport of wafer in the processor and semiconductor industry. Gecko uses a unique passive grip system that does not apply pressure to wafer and enables efficient processing, high production output, and exceptional reliability. Yaskawa Europe Technology is the perfect choice for semiconductor manufacturers, offering various innovative solutions. With worldwide support, high reliability, best performance, and accuracy, Yaskawa is the best partner for your best platform. Yaskawa, your first choice for wafer delivery automation solutions. Okay, 
Now I would like to talk a little bit about the considerations. Why Eskawa, a conservative company from Japan, uh, considered to invest in, uh, in Israel and establish its, uh, its uh, subsidiary in Israel? Just a second. Just a second. Top of my day. So Yaskawa, um, as a robotics company, uh, needed a cutting edge technology. As you know, the robotics uh, area has several very strong companies like Fanuc, like Kawasaki, like Mitsubishi, like KUKA and others. And Yaskawa was looking for cutting edge technology. We in Israel offered a very interesting, innovative technology in motion and nonlinear motion algorithms that improve robotics performance dramatically. Uh, and so after introducing this technology to Yaskawa, Yaskawa decided to establish a, jo a, a joint venture in Israel at a small investment amount uh, and gained the new technology access. This was the main reason for Yaskawa uh, to establish the joint venture in Israel. From that point on, uh, from 96, where it, the joint venture was established at 50%, 50-50 uh, partnership, uh, we continued R&D development, manufacturing and distribution until 2008. In 2008, Yaskawa decided to buy out the full operation and became a full owner uh, of 100% uh, in Israel. And then we continued successfully the development projects that we had for Japan, the sales and marketing activities, uh, and in 2016, we started a CVC corporate venture capital uh, fund to invest in high-tech uh, companies in Israel. In, tw in 2021, I can uh, tell you that our sales and business are at record levels, and we made several successful investments in Israel and very successful development projects. If we look at the outcome of what we did along the last 25 years, very successful R&D sales and investment, R&D results gave projects of motion algorithm and software, robotics, motion drives and controller, optical encoders development, new linear motor technology, industrial communication, uh, and semiconductor robots technologies. Uh, we had excellent sales results, both in Israel and in the European market, where we are um, responsible for the semiconductor Yaskawa robots distribution. And uh, in the CVC, the Corporate Venture Capital Fund that was established, we invested and continue investing in high-tech companies and I will say a few words about it in several areas like uh, rehabilitation, robotics rehabilitation, 3D print, AI, and other areas. So the company now is in Israel with 30 employees. We are focused on this, all areas of motion, industrial robots, semiconductor, investment activity, and R&D activity. Uh, and I would like to focus now a little bit on the uh, lessons that we can learn from uh, our activity in Israel. So just to show you before that, the two major investments we made, this is uh, a Rework Robotics, 
which is this exoskeleton, robotic exoskeleton uh, company. We invested uh, about uh, eight years ago, eight or nine years ago in 2014. Uh, this is another company, for example, it's called Massivit on the right-hand side. They are 3D print company for large objects and now um, is developing large 3D print molds for the um, composite material uh, area, which is a, a growing uh, area. This is our technology center in Israel. You can see a visit by the Japanese ambassador. Uh, the last Japanese ambassador, we have a training area and uh, we uh, entertain companies that come to learn how to work with uh, robots. Uh, finally, I would like to give you some um, of our uh, lessons that we learn uh, from our investment in Israel. First of all, first lesson is there is a great synergy between Israel, Israeli innovation and Japanese engineering uh, and technology. And uh, I saw it along the last 25 years. Um, we can see that there is a significant contribution, Iran, please, significant contribution to Yaskawa technology and global business. But nevertheless, there are business culture challenges. The business culture challenges are uh, short and long-term vision of the Japanese long-term vision and the Israeli a little bit more shorter uh, vision of the business and strategy. There is a difference in the focus on the, on the market. Uh, Israeli companies look more at the US market, look more at NASDAQ and the opportunity to, uh, to IPO in NASDAQ. Uh, of course, Japanese companies are more focused on the Asian market and the possibility to um, sell more in Asia, penetrate more in the Asian markets. Uh, we know that the Japanese business structure is more rigid, uh, less flexible, and we have to deal uh, with this gap between the rigid structure and the flexible uh, Israeli structure. There are communication challenges uh, between the two uh, cultures, uh, direct and indirect approach and so on and so forth. So there is a major culture challenge between the two um, culture, the Israeli and the Japanese. In total, I would say that there is a very high potential of Israeli, uh, Japanese technology and business cooperation in the high tech. Uh, the areas of interest for investment in Israel, high tech are very wide from cyber to AI, to virtual reality, agrotech, robotics, motion, vision, sensors, medtech, energy, clean tech, 3D print, digital printing, semiconductor inspection, and so on and so forth. And all these areas are extremely uh, interesting for Japanese companies. And uh, I would encourage Japanese companies to do the step of establishing centers in Israel R&D centers, business centers uh, in Israel, and to get fruit from the, uh, this uh, great synergy between the two cultures. Last word before I conclude is, I would encourage the Israeli government and the Japanese 
to pursue di direct flights. I know that there's been a decision on this. I was part of the Israeli government in 95, 94, that uh, uh, pursued the direct flights agreement. Uh, and I would also encourage you to work uh, on the mutual and cultural business promotion. We have to teach the Israeli side and the Japanese side how to work with each other and how to close the cultural gap uh, between the two cultures. And in order to get fruitful results of this cooperation. So this is my presentation so far. If you'd like to have some questions, please go ahead. I have one question regarding the CVC and the approval from Japan. Yes, I am part of the Yaskawa um, Investment Fund Committee. There is committee and I am doing mainly scouting, uh, but also part of the decision-making process. There is a group in Japan that is responsible and of course, we get approval from Japan and basically the investment is done directly from Japan to the company in Israel. それではご質問ご回答ありがとうございました。改めましてダン様ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. Thank you. さてここからはイスラエル企業6社の皆様によるショートプレゼンテーションのお時間です。なお各企業様へのご質問につきましては。プレゼンテーションの途中または直後までにズーム画面下の Q&Aから対象会社名と質問内容を記入し送信してください。まず最初のプレゼンテーションはバイオ様です。それではよろしくお願いいたします。Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Elad Fisher, and I'm technical sales manager for BioT. I'll be presenting our company today. If you give me a minute, I'll just put our slide on. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, no. Okay, so good morning, everyone. We are BioT. We're an Israeli startup a software based company. Uh, our offering is a, plat a cloud platform for connecting medical devices to the cloud. Uh, a few words about the company itself. Uh, we exist in three locations. Our headquarters are in Israel, and we also have branches in the US and in Germany. Uh, up to date, we have raised six and a half million dollars, and we are venture capital backed. Uh, we have above 20 customers worldwide to which uh, to their medical devices we've already connected to the cloud and uh, they are working on it. Uh, and that counts for uh, tens of thousands of, of connected medical devices today uh, in use uh, around the world utilizing our platform. Some of these are, uh, all, and this is including also FDA and uh, CE marked uh, devices. Uh, we are partners with uh, major integra integrators in the market and also with uh, AWS, which uh, serves as our main uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, we are uh, 35 and growing in employees. Uh, 
I'll show a short word about our history. We began about 10 years ago. Uh, first, it's as IoT based company. After several years, it transferred into IOMT. And uh, we realized that this domain is much more complex and uh, has a very large or very significant entrance barriers that uh, requires some uh, specific expertise. And uh, we began uh, utilizing this domain ever since. At first, as a bootstrap company doing projects. And at some point, we uh, decided to move on to the next phase, become a product company, and uh, wrap our abilities as a platform to be used for easy configuration. So basically, what is our uh, domain here? What is the, what is the problem? Um, if you are a medical device manufacturer, or if, or if you are even a pharma company that has also devices, uh, and you see that currently nowadays the, the challenge is to turn uh, the whole uh, connected world, the whole medicine world, into a connected care. Now, uh, when you are banking upon, upon such issues, you have many challenges to meet. Uh, first of all, usually your expertise will, will lie around the specific uh, device that you are manufacturing and also uh, in the clinical knowledge of how to interpret the, the results. But uh, you will be lacking whatever, whatever lies in between, which is, f first of all, the technical know-how of how to utilize uh, cloud infrastructure, meaning all the DevOps data, how to collect the data, how to manage the data, how to store the data, how to access the data. All of these are uh, questions that require expertise and also uh, require significant cost if they are handled in the wrong way. A second thing is when you uh, doing medical device or a medical device that are part of a pharma, pharma delivering devices, uh, you are managing basically a PHI, protected health information. When you do that, there are uh, several obstacles or several challenges that come to mind because you need to meet several uh, regulations that uh, revolve around it, such as HIPAA, GDPR, you need to be able to protect the data because a PHI is much more at risk or the results much be much, might be much more complicated than uh, managing some other types of data. And uh, you also need to think of another thing because uh, in the past you'll be, you've been utilizing or manufacturing uh, medical devices for the use of, of professionals in hospitals or in clinics. But for, uh, when you're moving into connected care and remote care, then uh, the users of the, your device need to, need to be uh, non-professional users, the patients themselves. So you need to uh, create the relevant workflow, both in the utilization of the device itself and also in uh, accessing the data for them, allowing them to, to view and access the data in, in, a, in a way that a, a layman will be able to understand. And uh, last but not least, uh, this data is it's quite good to, to be able to uh, retrieve and collect it from the devices, but you also need to have it accessed by, either, by also the professional uh, via your system and also to be able to integrate it into the different uh, data systems of the health bodies, such as EHR systems, the hospitals, etc. Of course. Okay. Okay, so we, okay. we just come to this slide. Thank you. Uh, okay, so as we mentioned before, the, the, the long from having a medical device and reaching to get the connected care solution is, uh, as the Beatles once said, the long and winding road. You have to go through a preparing the relevant uh, infrastructure, medical grade IoT cloud. You need to be able to uh, design and uh, implement your system in a way that it protects both the security, the risk of cybersecurity and handles also the issues of data privacy. You need to understand exactly how to perform the data collection. You need to be aware of the financial issues of it because once you are collecting data in the cloud and storing it in the cloud, then both transport and storage are costly. So you need to design it specifically and optimize exactly what you're doing. So you will not be ending up with very high cloud bill costs. You need to think of the right way how to perform the remote patient monitoring, how to engage the patient themselves. And only at the end of it, you, may, you are reaching the connected care solution. Now, this long and winding road may take you months to years to evolve. It will take you, it, it will require you to have the relevant personnel on board, and it will not be a one-time, one-off effort because you will still need to maintain it, keep it upgraded, and updated versus the different risk of cybersecurity that keeps evolving, updated uh, for different uh, update uh, of the privacy regulations, etc. So it's not only building it, it's also maintaining it for a while. The second option is just 
go through a platform that is specifically desi- designed for such things. So you'll be able to cut your show, cut your journey by far. Uh, we claim it to be up to 100 times re- reduction of time to build and up to 10, uh, 10 times reduction of the operating expenses due to the fact that you are utilizing an existing platform and uh, you have it uh, designed uh, and archi- uh, architected in the most optimized way to utilize the cloud resources in the best way possible. If we look a bit from, uh, from the top, or a, from a bird's eye view on, the, on this board, so as, as I mentioned before, we have a medical device. This medical device may, may have connectivity, well, it must have connectivity, but it may be a direct one, such as Wi-Fi or eSIM, that allows them to communicate directly to the cloud, or it may uh, need to be using some sort of a gateway, as example, uh, utilize Bluetooth and then connect to a mobile uh, application or an uh, application on top of a tablet, and from there connect uh, using the gateway abilities to the cloud. Uh, we provide SDKs, software development kits, uh, to be installed either on the device or on the gateway, depending on the use case. Uh, and these SDKs knows how to query the backend and get the relevant APIs to utilize. So the connection is quite, well, it's, uh, it's quite seamless to, to do. We can integrate into a new device with the uh, device manufacturer in a matter of hours to days, where usually this such things to develop from scratch takes weeks to months. Uh, on top of the cloud, we have our backend uh, infrastructure, which already has certain abilities and use cases uh, already developed, such as patient engagement, device management, patient monitoring, etc. Uh, we have out of the box three portals that I will look at at the, the next slide. And we also uh, uh, provide a built API and well-documented APIs in order to allow easy integration into the uh, data information of the care providers. Now, as I mentioned before, we have three portals out of the box. The first one is the Biotic Console. The Biotic Console allows uh, to build up the system and to uh, customize it to the specific needs of our customer, which means for his specific installation, he will be able to uh, configure and customize uh, the, the, the way that his objects and his entities look like and their attributes to configure it easily without, develop, without writing code, just utilizing a, a platform that allows the user interface to do so. You can think as illustration about uh, Wix for building websites. Once, uh, once upon a time, you had to be able to code the relevant uh, website you wish to build. So now you just enter a platform and you use a, a UI that allows you to do that easily. The second portal that we have is the manufacturer portal. The manufacturer portal is intended for the use of the device manufacturer. It allows him to uh, manage his customers, the organization that are utilizing the, um, his devices, to, meaning to assign which devices are used by which hospitals or, or by which doctor or by which clinic. It allows him to manage his, his devices to see which devices are active, which devices uh, have a need for a, for a firmware update, perform the firmware update, etc. And it also it allows him to perform data analysis because we provide access to the an anonymized aggregated data collected from the device. The device manufacturer will, will not be able to see a personalized data. He doesn't know who the data belongs to, but he does, but he is able to see the collected data overall and then perform his analysis, better his algorithms, etc. And the last uh, portal that comes out of the box as a, as a already built in a piece of the puzzle is the organization portal intended for the use of the caregivers, which meaning a doctor or a nurse or a clinical administrator can just access this portal, view the, view the patients, view the devices, and view the results of the patient. Uh, the, the way we utilize it is that we have uh, already uh, templates for any object in the system, and these templates are easily uh, adaptable, so it meaning you can alter the, the structure for any template, you can add fields that you wish, you can delete fields you don't need, uh, and you, create, uh, you can also uh, affect the way that these fields are displayed in the relevant portal. Uh, we also have the plugin approach for algorithms, which means that we allow you as the device manufacturer to write whatever uh, code for, for analyzing the results that you wish, and we just embed it into, the, into our solution. We wrap around it a Lambda function, and then we just uh, uh, run your code on top of your results. That allows you basically to uh, do whatever, uh, to, uh, to use whatever uh, professional knowledge you may have on, in, this, in this medical domain on top of the measured data. 
Uh, we are a AWS Advanced, Advanced Technology Partner, which means that we already architecture the system as, a, as optimized as possible. We, the architecture is, is already security based on a, us, utilizing microservices, segregating them, uh, and the, which each of a uh, microservice has authorization and access control. Uh, we have a built-in mechanism for, to protect the protected health information with data encryption. And uh, basically we continue to evolve and this, once you utilize our platform, this is a, a ever evolving platform, which means that every re relevant need, both in terms of functionality, both in terms of uh, cybersecurity uh, and uh, regulations, we just uh, continue to update uh, and evolve the, our platform. We provide out of the box visualization in order for uh, the customer to use. So they can, they can uh, configure whatever biomarkers they are connect, uh, collecting, whatever they want, want to see, define the ranges, uh, set up allowance on top of the data, view real-time data as both as historical views of the data, and also export this data easily into EHR systems. Uh, we also provide out of the box certain uh, uh, personalized uh, treatments for the patient engagement, such as adherence management, configure adherence tracking, uh, and also provide questionnaire side effect reporting, uh, a lot of uh, patient engagement abilities that are quite handy and, you, and important whenever you're transferring your care to the connected care. Uh, basically, that this allows us to improve the relationship between uh, the device manufacturer, between the care provider, and between the patient. And it also betters the, the situation in which the patient is getting a treatment in his own surroundings instead of hospitals. And that's about it. I left a couple of minutes for questions. So let's see whatever we have over here. Um, okay, I have a qu one question saying, it seems difficult for me to register my medical data. Uh, I'm not certain I get the problem. I'll, I'll explain a little bit. Uh, if you're a medical device manufacturer, it's not your medical data that you register. Basically, it's the medical data of your pay of the, the patients of your customer, the, the health bodies that buy your devices and provide them to, the, to, your, uh, to their patients. They need to be able to collect the data that these patients uh, manufacture or this device collects. Now, in order to do so, you need to be able to define exactly what is the data, the data stream that is uh, uploaded from the device. Uh, what are the relevant attributes, how to upload it safely to the cloud, and how to store it in a way, in a way that it's both secured and also a, a cost-effective, meaning data structure. Uh, in order to do so, we have our, a, a platform as a, stand -alone, as a configurable uh, product that you, can, you, you may use, and then you can just uh, adjust or define as a, a basic UI for users, exactly what is the data structure that you wish to maintain. And we managed to uh, envelope it in an applicative layer in order to protect it and, uh, and store it safely. Uh, let's see if I have any other questions. Uh, okay, so I think that's about it. Anyone wants to ask me? Because I don't, I don't seem to have any other uh, Q&A. We have about... Ah, we don't have any more time, okay. So thank you everyone. Hi, Bioti sama, arigato gozaimashita. Tsuzuite no presentation des. Karuta sensu sama des. Dozo yoroshiku onegai itashimasu. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Aviv, I'm the CEO of uh, Cartasense. We are uh, a private company uh, in the um, connected logistics, smart logistics uh, environment. Allow me just to share my presentation. Okay, so um, as I said, we are in the connected uh, logistics, specifically in the pharma logistics and the perishable sensitive food logistics. 
Um, before we uh, dive into uh, technology and the solutions, just an overview of uh, the market segments and the uh, glance of our customers. Um, uh, you can see here some of the market segments. These are uh, third party logistics by air or by sea, food logistics, warehouse monitoring, uh, food retail shops or uh, food retail distribution centers, drug stores, hospitals, food production, farm production. And basically it is divided into either facility monitoring, which is a stationary solution, or in the cold chain, uh, in the packages, in the containers, in the pallets. So um, a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, some examples of uh, uh, customers of ours uh, in order to uh, indicate uh, uh, the solution uh, with examples. For instance, Kuninagel, which is uh, one of the largest uh, freight uh, companies uh, in the world and is co and considered as uh, the number one in uh, pharma logistics worldwide, uh, uses a CartaSense uh, solution, CartaSense sensors, they call it uh, the Kuninage Blue sensor. And uh, it, we are in their uh, air freight uh, routes. And they are using our sensors, uh, one uh, inside the container and one outside the container. So there's uh, uh, always two sensors in each container, it could be a container, it could be a, a pallet of the pharmaceuticals. It's only on the pharma uh, air uh, cold chain. Another example is uh, you can see, if you can see my cursor here, the pharma packing. This is another uh, major uh, client of ours, SkySil is the company. They specify in passive cooled uh, pharma containers for air shipment. So in each of their container, by design, their containers embed two sensors, again, two sensors of a uh, CartaSense, one inside the package and one outside the, the package. Why two sensors inside and outside? I'll explain a little bit later. These are two examples for um, in the cold chain, in the uh, logistics uh, themselves. Uh, the other segment is facility monitoring, the stationary solution. So you can see here another customer of ours, uh, Swissport. Um, we have just finished uh, installing the first uh, Swissport um, installation in uh, Japan, in uh, Narita Airport. And the next stage will be a, a, a Kansai. And we even in, even with Kuninaga, we have uh, two uh, installation active installations: one in Areta, one in Kansai, in uh, Kuninaga facilities. And uh, um, for Swissport, we provide their monitoring, uh, their validation, their mapping, and uh, alerting, reporting, everything needed to uh, uh, to. Um, to be certified to uh, treat uh, pharmaceuticals uh, by uh, IATA. Okay, so this is a, this is a glance. Uh, and if there, if there are questions uh, later on, there will be Q&A. Okay, so this is a, a full vertical solution of the Cartesian solution. So, so what is the need, first of all? The need is to protect uh, to protect the shipments, to comply with uh, regulations, uh, pharmaceutical regulations, food regulations, and of course, first of all, to protect the, the shipment. You don't want the pharmaceuticals uh, to be out of a temperature range. You don't want uh, the food to be out of temperature or relative humidity range, because then it will not be usable and it is waste and we are all about reducing waste and reducing a, a carbon footprint. So uh, at the top, you can see a glance of a CartaSense product. It is basically divide, divided into uh, either sensors of several kinds and uh, CartaSense, uh, um, CartaSense infrastructure, uh, which I'll elaborate uh, uh, later on. 
the the second level is of course all the uh, analytics reporting web applications uh, risk reduction alerting and the uh, analytics and the third uh, level is uh, uh, validation and mapping this is what i've mentioned uh, uh, a little bit earlier for instance with uh, swiss port facilities we uh, prior to installing the uh, monitoring solution we do uh, we certify these uh, facilities by mapping them and validating them and uh, uh, de delivering a full report that with that they can go forward to the iata uh, inspectors and uh, till now we have a 100 percent success after our mapping and validation, um, you get certified. So this is another serv uh, service. The uh, mapping and validation is of course only for facility monitoring. It's only for uh, stationary solutions. Okay, so uh, um, Cobblestone's high runner is the U sensor. This U sensor has several unique features. First of all, it's very low cost, very low power. So when I say low cost, it enables us to have these sensors um, uh, be used as one time, one time use. That means there is no need for reverse logistics. For example, if you put uh, the sensor uh, in a manufacturing, pharmaceutical manufacturing, facility in uh, in India, in uh, Mumbai. And the uh, pharmaceuticals are traveling through air and they are get, ending the, uh, the cold chain, the first phase of the cold chain in uh, Central Europe to be distributed. The shipment is uh, then being uh, broken down and there's no more uh, pallets. It's now distributed as boxes. The sensors, however, needs to be either sent back to India, which is reverse logistics, or um, refurbished or recycled. So we have two solutions. Either you recycle the, the sensors themselves, but you don't need, uh, you don't need to send them back, or you pack, you collect them and and then once in a while you send them back to Cartesense for uh, refurbishing. But there is no hassle of reverse logistics. Sending back sensors to their origin is, as one of our customers said, it's a total headache. Of course, the sensors are uh, with FDA approved materials. They can come uh, with direct contact with food and uh, pharmaceuticals. And they use uh, the Cartesense a unique proprietary mesh network, which I will describe uh, in a moment. As you can see here in the slide, we have most air carriers approvals. So there's not so many, there are not so many uh, sensors that are allowed by air carriers um, to enter the shipment. And our sensors are not just approved by air carriers, they are approved with no limitations. The batteries are either very small lithium under the, the limit of the interest goods or non-lithium at all. So in no situation you will have to place uh, dangerous goods on, uh, on the shipment just because you're using uh, this kind of uh, wireless sensors. Okay, so a little bit about uh, the Cartesian's unique mesh network. So, so first of all, what is mesh network? Well, it's not a star network. A star network is the uh, regular network that you can find in your home. You have a Wi-Fi router and all the PCs and the smartphones are connecting directly to the router. This is a star. A full mesh means that every endpoint is also a repeater. And in Cartesian, Every sensor, no matter what sensor, is also a, a repeater. That means that information can hop from one sensor to another to the Cartesense infrastructure, the Cartesense gateways, and up to the cloud. 
that enables us uh, to have one gateway, one router, you can say, to cover a very, very large area, could be a very, very large uh, distribution center or very large um, uh, supermarket or um, let's say Swiss port, uh, ground handling service. In one gateway, you can cover all the ground handling service area. That's, that's one of the feature, uh, the full mesh. The second one is it is a very low frequency. It's not a 2.4 or 5 gig uh, or 5 gig uh, uh, frequencies. This is a sub one gig, spe specifically 433 megahertz. And this gives us much better uh, penetration through uh, radio obstacles like water, like metal. So you can place a sensor inside a pallet of tomatoes or a pallet, pallet of vaccines. From inside the pallet, after the, all the shielding and the thermal blankets and the water, the information will be transmitted and uh, reach the Cardasense cloud. And this, we have much experience with the uh, with this uh, network. It's a it's a very robust network, and it's more than uh, ten years now operating. And we have more than thousands, even endpoints uh, around the world. Okay, this is a a little bit uh, of our uh, roadmap. The use sensors, of course, the the veteran and the high runner. There's another segment uh, of uh, products called the, the M-Sensor, uh, which is a multi-sensor. It's a, uh, I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's a multiple probe sensor. And it's used for facility monitoring. It's not used for the uh, cold chain itself. And our, uh, our uh, coming solutions are the O-Sensor. The O-Sensor is now in a, in a pilot uh, stage which I'll describe in a moment, and the O-Tracker, which is a reduced cost uh, O-Sensor, and the O-Sticker at the end of the year, beginning of uh, next year. Okay, so here we are with the O-Sensor solution. So uh, this uh, O-Sensor is um, basically a, a modem in 2G and from four, in the 4G and fall back to 2G, but it also incorporates the Cartesense mesh and a BLE, and of course, GNSS location. And this O sensor is, uh, is, as I said before, is not using any lithium batteries. This is a one-time use, non-lithium battery for down to minus 35 degrees. So let's see, uh, let's have just one example of uh, the, the solution. Let's say that you have a four pilot shipment and you want to track and trace it and of course monitor the temperature and relative humidity. You place a U sensor inside each pallet, at least one. And you place one U sensor to the consolidated four pallets shipment. Now the U sensors are communicating with the O sensor up to the Cartesense cloud. So you get real-time location, real-time temperature monitoring, and the, and the shipment, the consolidated shipment intact indication. Let's say that one of the, uh, one of the pallets is left on the tarmac, is left uh, and uh, not collected. Now the shipment is, is not intact. There are only three pallets. Immediately, you will get an alert that one of the pallets has left the shipment and you know the exact time and the exact location where it happened, you can take action immediately. Uh, our uh, our uh, revolutionary solution for box tracking and, mo and temperature monitoring is the O sticker. So this device is, will be available for pilots at the end of the year, beginning of next year. And this is a very, very low cost beam, Wi Fi, a, a BLE beam, that means only transmitter. And it is used 
by O sensor to track a box level. So, and of course, everything is one time use. So now you have, let's say, one pallet with 60 boxes. You can place O sticker on each box and monitor and track each box. Okay, so till now we've talked about the CartoSense infrastructure and the CartoSense uh, products. Of course, there is the CartoSense cloud. And uh, in the cloud, we have all this, the regular services of reporting and alerting. And of course, all the data is, uh, is uh, collected and uh, managed uh, until uh, 10 years. You can uh, retrieve it. But there is, of course, the, the, the cherry point is the analytics, the BI and analysis. I'll give you just one example. And this is the temperature excursion prediction. So we have managed to uh, develop a very fast machine learning process to make a uh, lane assessment for air farmer shipments. Of course, it needs to be adapted to each lane. But by collecting information from our sensors, one inside and one outside the, the pallet or the container, and getting other information from the cloud, such as weather and the electronic MA bill, we can predict in high probability that even though the temperature is now intact, the temperature is now, uh, for, in pharmaceuticals, you can see that uh, uh, there is a regulation for two to eight uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, you see that the, the line here is uh, inside the limit, but we already indicate, this is the indicator, already indicate that there is a, a risk for this shipment. And 24 hours later, you see exactly that there is a temperature excursion. So this is our unique temperature excursion proven Prediction. Okay. Okay. So, so these are the uh, uh, these are the stockholders uh, of the company. I will not. Uh, you can see it uh, later on. I believe you will be. Uh, you, you can receive uh, this uh, presentation. So let's just move on to uh, Q and A. So just a second, let me see the Q&A. たいへんもしあげございませ。時間の関係上Q&Aにつきましては、後日回答をお願いいたします。改めまして、カルタセンス様、ありがとうございました。Okay, thank you very much, everyone. 続いてのプレゼンテーションです。エコウェイブパワー様。よろしくお願いいたします。Thank you. So the world needs to move away from fossil fuels, not only to combat climate change, but to supply affordable energy. I'm Matias Igal from EcoWave Power, and I would like to tell you about an overlooked source of green energy, wave energy. EcoWave Power developed an innovative technology to harvest the power from the ocean and sea waves. We all know that we need to move away from fossil fuels because it's one of the major causes of climate change. As you can see here, more than 80% of the energy is coming from fossil fuels. For tackling this at this advantage, we need to move away to renewable energy sources. And wave energy is a great solution because it has a lot of benefits. First of all, most of the people in the world is living close to this energy source. So we can reduce the transmission cost of electricity by generating the energy close to the users. And in Japan, that's something really easy to see. Wave energy is also stable and we can produce electricity 24 seven if we deploy the systems in suitable locations. 
And waves contain much more kinetic energy than wind, for example. It's estimated that waves contain more than 800 times the kinetic energy of wind, meaning that it can generate the same amount of electricity with smaller devices. In addition, it's an, ab an abundant energy source. Wave energy can provide twice the amount of electricity than the world produced today. However, we can't see commercial wave energy projects right now. And the reason is because most of the companies in the past installed their systems in the offshore, maybe four or five kilometers out from the coastline. Here you can see a picture of Pelamis, it's a wave energy company from the past. And they installed their systems maybe four or five kilometers out from the coastline. Because of this, they resulted in low reliability because in the offshore, there are waves that can reach more than 20 meters height and destroy those systems. In addition, to, because of being on the offshore, you need robust equipment and difficult maintenance with boats and divers, meaning high costs. And because they have high costs and low reliability, they were difficult to ensure. So that's why we can't see wave energy commercial stations everywhere around the world. To tackle these issues, EcoWave Power designed a technology that is located in the onshore. So as you can see in the picture, what we do is to install floaters in existing marine infrastructures like piers, jetties, and breakwaters. And then we have on land our conversion units. It works like this. The floaters is attached into an existing marine infrastructure like a pier, jetty, or breakwater, and it moves up and down with the motion of the waves. This makes a piston compress an hydraulic fluid that goes into an accumulator creating pressure that turns an hydraulic motor and turns a generator, generating clean electricity. As you can see here, only the floater is in contact with the water and all the rest of the system is located on land, safe for the wave environment. Here you can have a picture of our project that we have in Gibraltar. So as you can see, only the floaters are in contact with the water and all the hydraulic system is inside this container located on land, in this case, inside a tunnel. By doing so, we have several advantages. First of all, it's reliable. Here you can see a storm in Gibraltar. During a storm, the floaters can lift from the water level and protect from that storm. And because all the rest of the system is on land, it's completely reliable. Because of this, it's also insurable by well-known insurance companies, it's cost-efficient, and 100% environmentally friendly. We don't attach anything to the ocean floor. We only attach the system to existing concrete infrastructures. And in Japan, there are tens of them around the coastline. We installed our first project in Israel long time ago in 2014. This was an R&D power station located in Shafa port. And now this station is being expanded to 100 kilowatts and to be grid connected. You can see the, the illustration below in the project EcoWay Power EDF-1 in Israel. So in this project, we have a joint venture agreement with the French National Electric Company EDF, and we are working with Siemens. They provide part of the electrical equipment. Also, we got support from the Energy Ministry of Israel, mentioning the, te the technology as a pioneering technology. In Gibraltar, we're operating the only wave power station in the world that is connected to the grid under a PPA a power purchase agreement. This power station got support from the European Union. In addition to that, we are developing a project in Portugal in a bigger scale. So we sign a concession agreement with the Port APDL in Portugal for a project of 20 megawatts. And this will start with one megawatt because something interesting is that the, the technology is modular and scalable. We can start with a one megawatt project, for example, and then replicate it to reach a bigger power station. Currently, we have a project pipeline of more than 320 megawatts worldwide. This means projects in different stages, for example, projects into a concession agreement as the Portugal case or already installed and to be expanded like the case in Gibraltar. So now we are looking forward to discuss the development of wave energy projects in Japan because Japan has amazing conditions for this type of technology. First of all, the country is looking to get beyond zero target by 2050, meaning the inclusion of new renewable energy projects. 
and it has amazing wave energy conditions. You can see here the wave map. So our technology works with waves height between 0 0.5 and 5 meters height. And here you can see that the waves in Japan in almost all the country are between that range. So we can generate a insignificant amount of electricity. In addition, because of being an island, it has a really big coastline where we can deploy several megawatts of wave energy. So here I'm opening to you an opportunity to make a step for a more sustainable future. We are looking to discuss for the development of wave energy projects in Japan with site owners like ports, cities, and marinas, strategic partners like energy companies, renewable energy project developers, and other industries that are looking to develop renewable energy projects, and project investors in order to build our next project. We believe that to develop an energy transition, we need different energy sources. Won't be only wave, will be a combination, as you can see in this illustration. So we are looking to discuss for the development of wave energy projects in Japan to help the country reach their renewable energy targets. Thank you. I'm happy to, to answer any question uh, live. So Toru asked, isn't fragile due to the power of the waves? So basically the technology is designed to harvest the wave energy. So the technology works with waves between 0 0.5 and five meters height, as I mentioned below before. And if the waves are higher than that, we can use the storm protection mechanism, lift the floater from the water level and protect from that storm. And after the storm pass, the floaters goes back to operational mode. So uh, Takuya, thank you, thank you for your question. The, exactly, so we have different type of floaters for the different types of waves. So we have some different sizes in order to have the maximum efficiency for each design. Um, so your, your, your question is correct. Um, however, we have like few standard uh, uh, designs that we usually use for our projects. はい、それではエコウェーブパワー様ありがとうございました。続いてのプレゼンテーションです。ジェンセル様お願いいたします。Hello everyone. So 2022, we see that still the global warming is affecting us all over. We see the uh, catastrophe in events of uh, weather conditions that prevent us to get uh, direct uh, and constant power. And on the other end, damage the environment condition. And when we're looking into 2022 as well, we see that even today, there are more than 1 billion people that unfortunately live in a poor grid or in an off-grid environment, which means that they cannot get the energy and the chances like everyone else is getting. And this is the reason why GenCell was invited, invented. My name is Amit Ashkenazi, and I'm responsible for the global sales of GenCell. And in the coming few minutes, I will share with you who is GenCell and what GenCell is doing. GenCell is an Israeli company 
We are public company since 2020, it's traded in the Israeli stock exchange, and we are developing fuel cell. The entire development is being done in-house. We have 130 employees, 18 PhDs, and we are designing alkaline fuel cell. As alkaline fuel cell, we have product families that handle critical application and also primary power source to ensure that even in off-grid environment, whenever there is no grid, we will be able to provide the energy. As a company, as a technology company, we have developed many patents, more than 24 patents, 100 trade secrets, and we are already selling our product since 2015 for more than 22 countries. A fuel cell, it's not a new product. Fuel cell was invented in 1839, but it took time, it took time to mature the product. And we could see the fuel cell appearance in the Mir Space Shuttle and in the Apollo program. Both of them chose to work with alkaline fuel cell because of resiliency, reliability, emission free, no emission at all, no exhaust, low temperature, and the only byproduct is pure water. So imagine in that space shuttle just adding a mineral, you could use those water for drinking. And since then, since we established the company in 2011, we are trying to bring the technology down from space down to earth. We are very proud of our veterans engineers. We have few veterans that came from the Mir Space Shuttle and were part of the development. As every technology, whenever you introduce it, you need to handle CAPEX and OPEX. So when we address that challenges, we are today the only fuel cell globally that does not use platinum in our catalyst. And this is huge advantage for us because we are not depending on one supplier and the cost of our catalyst is 1,000 times cheaper than the rest of the industry. And with this catalyst, we are making the anode and cathode, which is the heart of the system and building the stacks. When it comes to OPEX, we also were challenged by the cost of fuel and the cost of operation. And then we address them as well. And we are one of the few fuel cell today that can run by using industrial grade hydrogen, the low purity, and even less than the industrial, what comes directly from SMR process, which is a very low purity. Our fuel cell can work with that, can cope with that, and they don't have any concern. And when it comes to primary power source for rural area, we are the only fuel cell today globally that is able to use ammonia, liquid ammonia, as a source of hydrogen. And I'm going to talk about that in my presentation. So when you're looking into core technologies, there are three main elements that we are focusing on. The first one is hydrogen to power. Hydrogen to power means that we are able to provide energy completely green whenever is needed by using our non-platinum catalyst and providing zero emission signature. Ammonia to power is our second product. This is the ability to use the ammonia as a source of hydrogen, where we develop the reformer that breaks the liquid ammonia into hydrogen and nitrogen. The nitrogen is being released back to the atmosphere because it was borrowed as part of creating the ammonia, while the hydrogen is injected into the unit and provide 24 seven full year of operation without the need to be refueled. Our next generation development is our green ammonia to power. So we are now developing the ability to generate green ammonia on site, on demand, and removing the need to buy the ammonia, to mobilize it, and to have a complete green solution. As alkaline fuel cell, there are some uniqueness and advantage that were well, the reason we chose to focus on that. And the main idea is because of resiliency, is because of reliability. When you are looking into high, uh, alkaline fuel cell, so we have the ability to, offer, to run with a low purity of hydrogen. We can run in a very extreme weather condition, whether it's minus 20, minus 30, and even minus 44 as we're running now in Canada centigrade. On the other end, we can run in a very high temperature. 40 and 45 degrees does not affect us. And in case of a need, we are even able to run 
up to 55 centigrade degrees. Humidity does not affect us. We can run in 95% humidity. High altitude, we are running today in more than 2000 meters. And as you know, as high you go, the concentration of the oxygen is reducing. That does not affect us, not to mention running next to the sea. Salty environment is also something that we are able to run. So by mitigating and, and aggregating the platinum free solution, the resiliency and flexibility on operation, whether it's a backup solution with industrial grade hydrogen or as a primary with liquid ammonia, that gives us huge advantage to provide solution to different type of application. So when we are looking into the product catalog or the product family, so if you look on the left side, you see the hydrogen to power solution. These are the backup solution. And that include also the standalone fully outdoor unit, the Gensel box solution, and also the Gensel rec solution. So when it comes to the rec solution, and also the next generation, the ammonia to power, they are both using the same platform. The same Gensel box that you see on the left side is the platform for whatever solution we are giving. And this gives us a lot of flexibility. And the only thing that is changes is the source of the hydrogen. Now, the Gensel box was designed as a fully outdoor solution to provide long duration backup, whether it's for minutes, two hours, to a day, or even to a week. And with that, you can make sure that your critical application will always be up and running and you will be able to provide the service that you are looking for. The Gensel Rex range extender is a unit that was designed specifically to work with the power utilities segment, but not only. The uniqueness of this shelter is that it's divided into two rooms. One room is with the backup equipment. The second room contains the hydrogen cylinders. And this unit was certified to run within utilities running beneath the hundred of thousands of high voltage. It's also cybersecurity to comply with the regulation of utilities. And this shelter is seismic certified. So for countries that suffer from earthquake from time to time, this unit is able to run and provide the energy up to 7.2 Richter. This unit is already massively deployed today in US, and in Israel, and nowadays in Mexico, in a large deployment, providing long duration backup to the substation and also to the telecom equipment within the substation. This unit can be also customized to support different type of application that requires the same conditions. The middle picture, the ammonia to power, this is our Gensel Fox solution, providing support and energy fully around the clock without emission without pollution and much more reliable solution. The entire portfolio is managed and controlled remotely with our IoT that can be integrated to any existing network operation center today. And with this solution, you can control and monitor thousands of units, learning about their day-to-day -day operation, status, output voltage, amount of fuel, and including preventing maintenance as well. Let's focus specifically on Gensel box solution. So the box solution as of today provides five kilowatts with the ability to modular for 10, 15, 20, up to 50 kilowatts if needed. A fully outdoor solution, 48 volt DC as a default, but it's capable and able to support any other type of output voltage. This unit is uh, deploying today and provide long duration backup for different type of application flexible, resilience, and can do the job whenever you need the job to be done. There are different type of uh, hydrogen sources. You can get the hydrogen in cylinder as a standalone cylinder, or as you can see in bundles. So depending on the load and the amount or number of outages and the logistic cycle that you would like to have, we can dimension the amount of cylinders and provide the required power whenever the power is needed. If we are looking into the Gensel Fox solution, so this is again the same platform, the same machine, but this time, instead of using hydrogen from cylinders, we are extracting that from hydrogen ammonia. 
So imagine you have a rural area, whatever will be the application, whether it's a telecom tower or a community or even a clinic that needs to be powered and there is no grid, there is no alternative. So in that case, you can mount one, ta one ta tank of ammonia, vertical, horizontal, both of them available today. So keeping uh, 12 to 15 tons of ammonia on site based on the local regulation and the permits, you can run fully non-stop without the need to refuel the site. So that's bring a huge message here to the audience because unlike diesel generator that usually today are working as that for that purpose, probably requires two set of diesel generator because they cannot run 24 seven. With all the operation service, maintenance and losses and downtime, now there is a full green solution without emission, without the requirement to visit the unit frequently, and not only completely green, so you will be able to use the credit for the CO2, but also can save a lot of money on the operation. This solution today can provide the energy without the consent. So whether you are running uh, uh, in a hybrid solution that you, you are using already alternative solution, we can integrate the entire portfolio to work with your existing infrastructure, solar panel, uh, wind turbine and batteries, all the entire portfolio can be used and integrate with them and providing the energy as long as you need the energy. When it comes to service, both units, whether it's backup or primary are almost service free. Backup requires only once a year visit for less than two hours and the primary solution requires the same visit, but twice a year. So when we are looking into interoperability, so the communication, communication is fully secured. We can use private cloud, private cl uh, or, or, or public or private cloud. When it comes to monitoring our infrastructure today, the IoT provide you the ability to monitor the unit remotely and learn about its operation, as I mentioned. In, as nothing is moving in our unit, it's a completely silent, it's a chemical process. So the requirement for visit is very low. And in case of suspected failure, it can be debugged remotely so you can understand what is happening with the unit. And in case of a need to send anyone to this site so you know exactly what is the problem. Simple maintenance, simple operation, of course, flexibility to integrate to any existing monitoring system. Now we talked about the hydrogen to power and we talked about ammonia to power. So we are looking into the future. And when it comes to the future, we want to avoid the need to mobilize the ammonia to the site. So actually what we are doing these days is we are developing a new way, a new methodology, unlike the existing one, which consume a lot of energy and also polluting. So we are developing as a chemical company, a new catalyst to be able to generate green ammonia on site, on demand. We only need solar panel, air and water, tap water, raining water. And it's going to be in a one phase of production. So imagine that you don't need to buy the fuel anymore. You will produce the fuel on site, on demand. There will be no need to keep a large tank on site because you can only keep one square, one meter, uh, one met metric meter, which is one ton of ammonia that will provide the energy for three to four weeks. And you keep generating that. You're avoiding the need to spend money and pollution for mobilizing the ammonia. So if we already with using the uh, brown ammonia today are able to save 30 to 50% of your operational cost to run the unit. So with this solution that will be even extended. So the potential saving is even much higher. This solution is addressing the telecom market today and designed for telecom market, but not only. When it comes to the ammonia solution, we are doing a lot of project with the telecom arena, but this platform of generating the green ammonia can be source of the ammonia to many other type of application today that taking advantage of ammonia. So looking into the different segments that we are addressing today, off-grid solution for remote communities, for the telecom industry, whenever you have a site that you need to power it, whether it's with the brown ammonia, the, uh, the green ammonia, 
When it comes to telecom, we are massively involved. Just yesterday, Deutsche Telekom published the announcement of our strategic cooperation. And if any of you is going to visit Mobile World Congress, the telecom, annual telecom event next week, we are going to be in Deutsche Telekom's booth, so you can see. But they are not the only one that take advantage of our unit. There are also other players in Asia, in Europe, in US, that are taking advantage within the telecom. When it comes to EV charging, this is the new segment that we are penetrating today, providing the ability to charge cars with uh, the ammonia solution or with the hydrogen solution. Critical application like cardiac catheterization rooms are taking advantage of our solution. Water utilities, oil and gas industry, energy storage using uh, hydrogen as a storage or even ammonia as a storage. And of course, manufacturing plant and not to mention substations that using the solution. So this was a quick introduction about Jensen, and I would be happy to accept any type of question. Hi. ありがとうございました、えー、ご質問一件来ているようですけれどもご回答をよろしくお願いいたします改めましてジェンセル様ありがとうございました Thank you. それでは続いてのプレゼンテーションですオーカム様よろしくお願いいたしますはい、えー、オーカムテクノロジーズの柳平大と申します、えー。よろしくお願いいたします。はい、えー、弊社ではですね、えー、目の見えない方、見えにくい方を対象にした世界で最も高度な、えー、視覚支援機器の、えー、製造開発販売を行っております。えー、本社はエルサレムにあります。えー、オーカムはですね、えー、視覚障害者の目となり、えー、様々な情報を読み上げて、えー、教えてくれます。例えばですね、えー、耳が見えにくい方が補聴器を、えー、使われるように、えー、目が見えにくい方、見えにくい、えー、見えない方に関しては、えー、オーカも、えー、ご活用いただくというふうにイメージしていただけるとですね、わかりやすいかなと思います。はい、えー、早速なんですけども、えー、実際にですね、デモンストレーションを、えー、行っていきたいと思います。ですね、すみません、その前に、あごめんなさい、えー、と実際のです、ねえーまあ、デバイスなんですけども、えーまあ、このようにあの100円ライターと同じぐらいの、えー、大きさになっております。重さは 22g、えー、ほどですね。こちらを、えー、眼鏡の縁に、えーですね、パチッと、えー、つけていただいて、あとはあの読みたいものですね、例えば、えー、本、資料、えー、名刺、レストランのメニュー、えー、等々を目の前に、えー、出していただきますで。出していただいて、横をタップしますで。このようにタップすると、テキストを読むことができます。失礼しました。暗かったですね、失礼いたしますで。タップをするとですね、この後に。ちょっと近づけますね。すみません。今、えー、私の、えー、ドキュメントを読んでおります読み上げてくれますので、まあ、例えば本、その他にもですね、例えば、えー、メ,ールメールですね、電子メール、スマートフォンの画面、えー、等々を、えー、読み上げて、えー、くれます。次にですね、えー、ちょっと紙幣、試してみたいと思います。こちら、目の前に1000円札があるんですけども、こ
こちらをですね、同じように目の前に出していただいて、そしてですね、これをタップします。はい、今、えー、1000円と、えー、読み上げました。次にですね、一万円札で、えー、試してみます。失礼いたします。すみません。はい、あ、すみません。あのー、こちらのですね、紙幣の。えー、人物の方に反応、えー、してしまったんですけども、えー、基本的にはですね、えーまあ、そういった紙幣、えーまあ、人の顔ですね、えー、活字っていうのを、えー、読み上げてくれるものになっておりますそのたりにもですね、えー、今私時計をつけてないんですけども、えー、このようなジェスチャーをするとですねはいえー、このように、えー、日時を、えー、伝えてくれたりとか、えー、いわゆる、えー、視覚障害者が必要としている機能がです、ね、こちらにすべて、えー、集約されている、えー、製品となっておりますすみません、カメラがオフになっているようなんですがあすみません、大変失礼いたしました。ごめんなさい、すみません。すみませんあすみません、今映ってますかね映ってますあ、すみません、ずっともしかしてオフになってましたちょっとオフでしたねあごめんなさいあ、申し訳ございません、失礼いたしましたですちょっとすみません、あの大変失礼いたしましたえっ、ー、とですね、ちょっともう一度ごめんなさい、実際のデバイスなんですけどもこういったあのものになっておりますあの100円ライターと同じぐらいの大きさのものですもう一度あの活字の読み上げのちょっとデモンストレーションだけさせてくださいすみませんこのようにですねメガネの縁にパチッと、えー、取り付けていただけるようなものになっております読みたいものですね、えー、っていうのを目の前に出していただいてあとは横をタップしますはい、でそうすると、ですね、えー、このように、まあ、本、えー、資料などですね、書くのであれば、えー、読み上げるような、えー、機能になっておりますで。こうするとですね、えー、止まるような仕組みになっております。で先ほどすみません、途中であの止めてしまったんですがあの、今、時計つけてないんですけども、えー、時計もですね、まあ、このように、えー、日時と、えー、いうのを伝えてくれると。くれるとというものになっておりますすみません大変失礼いたしましたいやちょっと資料の方すみません、えー、戻らせていただきますはいでですねまあ実際のあのユーザーさんの、えー、まあコメントではあるんですけどもえー、いわゆる自力で読書する場合ですね、えー、例えば10分間読書するのが精一杯だったと、で無理をするとですね、えー、頭痛やめまい、えー、吐き気がしてしまう、えー、そうですね、オオカムを使用してからは疲労感を軽減できて、えー、長時間の読書もできるようになりましたと、でオオカムは、えー、情報弱者である、いわゆる、えー、視覚障害者の、えー、最高のパートナーですといった、えー、声をいただいております。弊社の製品なんですが、えー、2つラインナップがあります。で1つ目がですね、マイリーダー2。こちらが、えー、活字のですね、読み上げ機能のみ搭載したものとなっております。で下にあるものが、えー、オーカムマイアイ2。こちらがですね、先ほど紹介させていただいた、いわゆるあの物、えー、人物の認識、えー、等々のですね、必要な、えー、機能がすべて集約されているフルスペックの、えー、ものですね。こちらが四十九万八千円となっております。一見ですね、あの高く聞こえてしまうと思うんですけども
、えー、大体こういったいわゆるその福祉機器といったのはあのこれぐらいのです、ね、価格で販売されているのが現状です。でただ一方で,です、ねえー、ユーザーさんが購入される場合、えー、日常生活用給付事業の対象となっておりますので、えーまあ、自治体によってばらつきはあるんですけれども、まあ、約20万円ほど、えー、自治体から、えー、給付されるような、えー、仕組みになっております。現在、全国で,です、ね、100以上の、えー、自治体に、えー、給付の給付対象になっております。ですね、あの2019年に読書バリアフリー法案といった法案が成立したんですけどもいわゆるあの視覚障害者や発達障害者の方たちに対してですねいわゆるあの読書しやすい環境を、えーまあ、整備しなさいと、えー、そういった法案が成立したんですけどもそういった影響もあってですね、えー、弊社の製品をですね、えー、例えば豊島区の図書館さんや、えー、こちら岡山県のです、ね、三崎町の図書館さんなので、えー、導入されております。はい。えっ、ー、とここからすみません。あの Q&A に、えー、移らせていただければと思います。Q&A。はい。えっ、ー、と電源。電源ですね電源あの基本的にいわゆる充電して使えるようなものになっておりますので、えーまあ、フル充電は約90分ですねあ、ごめんなさい、45分ですね、45分充電して、えー、90分間の連続使用が可能になっております、リチウム,チウムイオンバッテリー、えー、ですね、バッテリーに関しては。で、メンテナンス、メンテナンスは特にございません。あの基本的にですねソフトウェアは一応アップデートできるようになっておりますので、我々の方でですね、ソフトウェアのアップデートがあるときには、アナウンスをさせていただいて、ユーザーさんの方で w i f i を通じてアップデートしていくと、そういった仕組みになっております。はい、イヤホンに接続できたりするんでしょうか。はい、イヤホンに接続できます。Bluetooth の機能が搭載されておりますので、Bluetooth で接続してイヤホンにつなぐ。とも可能です。はい、えー、Q&A 以上となりますかね。はい、すみません、前半あの、えー、画像見大変失礼いたしました。申し訳ございません。はい。ご案内が遅くなりまして申し訳ありませんでした。いや本当に申し訳ございません。大変失礼いたしました。申し訳ございません。それでは、大神様、どうもありがとうございました。はい、ありがとうございました。失礼します。では、最後のプレゼンテーションとなります。九州様です。よろしくお願いいたします。So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this last、uh, talk of today. My name is Danny, and I'm the co founder and the chief customer officer with QC. Today's talk is about a cup of coffee or a piece of cake and how we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to help process manufacturers save millions on their operating costs. When we look on the entire supply chain, From the raw materials to the end product and beyond, we see that this is a very long and complicated process. So, during this long and complicated process, many inefficiencies can occur in any of the stages, resulting in、uh, excessive waste,、uh, the need to do rework if the product quality is not sufficient, product recalls. Uh, excessive energy consumption, uh, uh, waste of、uh, raw materials, environmental pollution, and so on and so forth. I took here a quote from April 2021, last year, saying that the loss due to poor quality is enormous for the industrial sector, over $860 billion. And it's most of the, uh, uh, this is the most contributing uh, loss uh, to the global waste. Now, this is exactly 
what QC comes to help with. Make the entire supply chain process much more efficient with higher quality. How we do that? We address four major challenges in the smart factory or industry 4.0 architecture. I will start from the left. The first challenge is that today there are quality issues that result in product defects. The difference between manufactured products, uh, uh, one product is not similar to the other that was manufactured an hour later. And sometimes if the quality of the process or the product is not sufficient, it results in some downtime. The second challenge is that today everything generates data. Um, it could be IoT devices, sensors, MES, ERP, SCADA. And the uh, challenge today is not necessarily to generate or to collect the data, but to correlate it, which means to make um, some kind of a, a meaningful insight uh, by learning it. The third, the third challenge that we are addressing is the quality test. Today it's done manually. It means that there is a laboratory that takes samples during the production process. It could be every two hours, it could be once a day, but two major challenges are uh, applicable with this uh, uh, point. The first one, when you do something manual, it may include errors and mistakes. And the second thing is that if you don't do it on a regular basis or automatically, you don't have complete visibility for the process, which means you have blind spots. So you don't know what's the actual quality of your process. The last challenge that we are addressing is the difference between work shifts. Uh, older people have more experience because they spent more time near the production line than younger people that didn't spend so much time. So one of the things that we are helping with is to normalize the knowledge base of experienced workers with less experienced workers. And most importantly, we make sure that the knowledge stays with the company because when older people retire, we need to make sure that the knowledge is not living with them. So how can we help uh, minimizing those challenges? And this is the reason why I use the a cup of coffee and piece of cake example. In Israel now it's morning, you have the afternoon, so it's a perfect time to get your cake near the, your coffee. In order to get the perfect cake, we are going to buy the top ingredients in the market and go to the grocery shops. This is equivalent to the raw materials in the plant. Then, in order to bake the cake, we are going to buy the oven, the mixer, and even take the local cooking book in order to prepare the perfect cake. And this is equivalent to the production line, machines, SCADA, uh, industry 4.0 layer, and so on and so forth. Still with the top ingredients and the best tool in the market, it's very difficult to guarantee that the cake is going to turn perfect. Is it going to be with the right texture? the right height, the right sweetness. Is it going to be identical to the recipe you planned it to be or identical to the cake you baked a week ago? In essence, this is QC technology and how we can help you. It's called product or process quality control. And what we do in essence is we give you a very early alert in the beginning of the process or during the process that something is not going to be according to what you expect. It could be the energy consumption, the pollution, it could be the yield, it could be the mixture, the weight of the product. It could be many KPIs that influence eventually the process and the product quality. Then we are going to predict, to give you a prediction, which means what is the expected value of your target? For example, if it's a weight target, we will give you the prediction what's going to be the weight of the cake. And if it uh, crosses the boundaries that you are allowing uh, by the recipe, which means it's too heavy or it's too light, we will issue a prescription, which is the most important thing in QC offering. And this is unique because it's not only to give you a prediction that something is not going to be according to what you plan, 
but help you with a recommendation what you need to do to fix it. Please add two spoons of sugar. Please speed up the mixer 5% up. Please reduce the temperature in the oven on the right side by two degrees and so on and so forth. So eventually you have a perfect cake. Now, QC technology is not coming to replace any of your current smart factory technologies, Mitsubishi, Yokogawa, ABB, Azure, and so on and so, on and so forth. We already uh, are uh, integrated with those solution types. And what we do, we help you with actionable insights by using the same data that you are already collecting. Now, in order to do that, we harness artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Now, you probably heard of many artificial intelligence technologies in the market. So I'll give you in this uh, uh, slide a little bit of uh, 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 the, the explanation what is different or how QC is different from those technology types. Let's start with the predictive maintenance, which is by far the most popular technology today in the production lines for uh, uh, utilizing artificial intelligence. The focus of predictive maintenance is the well being of the machine. So the focus is one machine and the well being of this machine. Is it going to work? Do you need to do maintenance and so on and so forth? The difference is that QC with the prescriptive analytics looks on the entire supply chain, not specific machine, rather than the entire supply chain. And we are going to give you a recommendation if there is a need for a specific machine. Another example is called process optimization technology, sometimes referred to as soft sensor. And in this technology type, you don't get, like in QC case, the root cause analysis. So for example, I can recommend you what is the temperature, but not the reason to change the temperature. And most importantly, process optimization technologies do not have the prescription or the recommendation followed by the prediction. There are other technology type, digital twin, monitoring, IoT systems. They are all great technologies. QC offers something different. Now, Let's see how the technology can help you in real cases. In the first example, I'm uh, uh, showing a chemical plant. In this example, it's a fertilizers plant. And in this example, we are helping the company uh, uh, optimize the gas to steam uh, uh, ratio. It means that in order to create the steam, the energy in the boiler, we need to input gas. In this example, it's natural gas. Uh, and the fact that gas is expensive, uh, energy source, uh, uh, will help this company to save money because we optimize the ratio of the required gas to the required steam, which means we don't waste too much gas on that, on that aspect. The direct result of our experience with this company is 5% reduction in the gas consumption. Uh, I know that in Israel, the prices of natural gas are, gas are relatively low comparing to the rest of the world, but still uh, uh, the rest of the world gas prices are expensive. So uh, reducing 5% in the overall cost means savings of uh, uh, around $1 million per year. There is also indirect contribution because if we uh, use less gas, we pollute less. We, we are uh, uh, helping the company be more sustainable we are stabilizing the process because the boilers now are more efficient and so on and so forth. Another example is for cement plant, the building materials industry. In this example, uh, we, QC is helping to predict the 28 day cement strength. This is under regulation because when the cement leaves the factory, it needs to be strong enough. So if you put it into the concrete or the building, it will stay strong. In 28 days, the cement that left the, comp the plant is already deployed with the building. So it's important to take the actual uh, uh, measures and make sure it's meeting the standard. The problem with this uh, uh, cement manufacturing is that 50% of the cement cost is contributed by the energy because it's an energy heavy uh, consumed uh, process. So by helping them and minimizing the standard deviation, we help them to improve the productivity by 7% and by that result, a 10% energy saving. 
which means uh, it's a substantial saving for the process. Plus we guarantee that the quality is higher and we allow them to sell in higher prices. The indirect contribution, which is, which is as important is to reduce the CO2 footprint. The cement industry is responsible for 8% of the global CO2 pollution. So any saving in this aspect is great for the company and the plant sustainability. The last example is another chemical plant. In this example, is it's a high performance materials lines, uh, similar to plastics. And in this uh, example, we are helping them to predict and prescribe the viscosity variance in a long tail uh, product. It means that these are the less popular products. And it means that you are producing less batches from this type. So any mistake in this long tail product uh, will cause a rework or a lot of scrap and you are going to miss your time to market. So in this example, I'm happy to share that we are able to improve by more than 30% the faulty batches uh, due to uh, uh, viscosity problems in the line. Okay, to summary, because uh, that's your last uh, talk of today. Um, QC is already operational and serving continuous and batch process manufacturers in the building materials like cement, gypsum, metals, and glass, as well as chemicals, uh, pulp and paper, and so on and so forth industries. And we are um, interested to uh, partner with uh, Japanese partners and end customers for the chemicals and the building materials industries. We have super fast engagement process within, within two months, we are completing the modeling and the system is ready for commercial deployment. With that, I finish my uh, talk. Arigato gozaimasu, thank you very much. If you have any questions, either ask me directly or via the dedicated team in the Israeli uh, attache uh, in Tokyo. Uh, thank you very much. QC 様、ご質問が一件いただいております。お答えをお願いいたします I have a question here. Can I answer it? Is it okay I answer it live now? Okay, so the, the question is how do we monitor the entire supply chain? And that's it, it easy because we don't monitor a specific machine. We are connected to the data lake. So anything that is available in the data lake from the raw materials to the end product and even beyond, which means if you have customer feedback or customer complaints connected to this data, we are able to uh, uh, aggregate it. And the beauty is that we are able to correlate many sources of data. So there is actually no limitation to the amount of data and the amount of parameters that we are uh, uh, analyzing. It's like a big data analysis. And therefore we are able to see and locate the exact place in the supply chain that the uh, fault or the defect was created and provide the recommendation how to fix it. To, to fix it. I hope I answered uh, the question, uh, Takuya-san. はい、それでは QC 様ありがとうございました。Thank you very much.
皆様いかがでしたでしょうか、えー、お時間の都合上短いご紹介時間となりましたがご関心を持たれた企業様もあったのではないでしょうか、えー、イスラエルよりプレゼンテーションをいただきました企業の皆様改めましてありがとうございましたでは続きましてイスラエル大使館経済部商務官樋口由紀様より本ミッションの全体公表と今後のイスラエルビジネス等についてご紹介いただきますそれでは樋口様よろしくお願いいたしますただいまご紹介に預かりましたイスラエル大使館経済部西日本イスラエル貿易事務所の樋口と申します皆様この度は2日間約5時間にわたりまして九州オープンイノベーションセンタイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションにご参加いただきまして誠にありがとうございましたまた九州オープンイノベーションセンター会長で本ミッションの団長でいらっしゃいますウリウ道明様株式会社成功電機製作所代表取締役会長で副団長でいらっしゃいます土屋直則様をはじめご関係者の皆様この度はこのような素晴らしいイベントを通して主に九州の方々にイスラエルのイノベーションを詳しくご紹介する機会をいただきまして心から感謝申し上げます九州オープンイノベーションセンター様には約2年前からイスラエルへの現地視察ミッションを通してイスラエルの先端技術やイノベーションに直接触れてイノベーションのエコシステムを構成するスタートアップや公的民間機関との関係を構築したいという強いご意向を伺ってまいりました大変残念なことにその直後に新型コロナウイルスのパンデミックが始まりましてついに現地視察を中止せざるを得ないことになってしまいました同じようにこういったパンデミックのために中止されてしまったイスラエルへのミッションは全国で数多くございますただその中で驚くべきことに九州オープンイノベーションセンター様だけが完全に中止されるのではなくバーチャルで現地ミッションを開催するという大体案をご提案されましたご存知の通り現在では多くのセミナーや展示会がオンライン形式で開催されておりますまた初対面の人とのオンラインでの会議も普通になってまいりましたただ現地ミッションとなると話は別ですミッションであれば一つの集団がいくつもの機関や企業を訪問して進行を深めます一体バーチャルでそういったことが可能なのかご相談をお受けし,てしましてから私とも一緒に悩みながら企画を練ってようやくこのようなイベントの開催に至りましたもちろん現地に行かなければ得られないものは本当にたく,すたくさんございます現地の人との触れ合いや何気ない会話、またミッションの参加者同士の交流、現地の空気や食事、文化など、五感を刺激されるような体験は現地に行かなければ決していられません。今回のコロナの収束後には、皆様、最初の海外出張や旅行先として、ぜひともイスラエルに実際に来ていただきたいと思います。その一方で、本来は現地ミッションに参加される方だけが会える人や、訪問できる機関、そういったところに多くの方々が同時に、しかも短期間に訪問できる、それが今回のウェブミッションの最大のメリットでした。実際のこのイベントには、130名を超える方がお申し込みになられまして、わずか2日間でイスラエルのイノベーションシステムを多様な観点から疑似、えー、体験していただけました。さらに本日はこの後、今回登壇したイスラエル企業との商談会が開催されます。オンラインのイベントの利点の一つは、そのイベントが終わってもオンラインで参加者と再びつながりやすいという点です。今回の商談会自体は満席となっておりますが、皆様の中でこの2日間に登壇したイスラエル企業に興味をお持ちになられた方は、ご都合に合わせてオンラインの会議を作らせていただきますので、ぜひとも私どもイスラエル大使館経済部、または九州オープンイノベーションセンター様にお知らせください。また、今回のイベントでは、イスラエルに関する一般的な情報や、いろいろな産業分野の企業やスタートアップをご紹介いたしましたが、皆様の中には特定の技術に特化した情報を必要とされる方や、イスラエルとのパートナーシップの構築に向けた取り組みを加速させたいとお考えの方もいらっしゃるかと思います
そのような具体的なご相談もお待ちしております繰り返しになりますが今回のイベントはその名称でありますイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションの通り現地ミッションをバーチャルで体験していただきましたそして現地ミッションとは現地に行くこと自体が目的ではございませんご参加の皆様におかれましてはイスラエルのイノベーションに基づく新規事業の創出やオープンイノベーションの促進さらに日本世界での飛躍に向けて今回の体験を一つのステップとしてご活用いただけますことを心から願っております最後に九州オープンイノベーションセンター様におかれましては今回のイベントのご成功をお喜び,お喜び申し上げますとともに今後のさらなるご発展をお祈り申し上げますこの度は本当にありがとうございました木口様ありがとうございましたさてミッション第2日目も終了の時間が近づいてまいりました最後に本ミッションの主催者を代表いたしまして一般財団法人九州オープンイノベーションセンター常務理事山田真嗣より本日ご参加の皆様へ閉会のご挨拶を申し上げますそれではよろしくお願いいたします九州オープンイノベーションセンターは2020年の設立当初から世界のオープンイノベーション拠点との交流を進めており世界最先端のイノベーション力を持つスタートアップ大国イスラエルを最初の相手国としてセミナーを通して交流に取り組んでまいりました。この度、新型コロナ感染症の拡大で現地ミッション、これは出すことができなかったんですが、このようなウェブミッションという形で、現地のキーパーソン、キーカンパニーとライブで交流の場を持つことができ、本当に嬉しく思っております。特にイスラエルイノベーション庁国際協力部、アビルフトン部長からご紹介いただいた日本とのコラボレーション事例はとても参考となりましたまた昨日イスラエル商工会議所様にご紹介いただきました5社と本日プレゼンテーションいただきました6社の事業はいずれも先進性があり魅力的でとても刺激的な内容だったと理解しておりますミッション団の会談にあたり、本ミッションの企画・運営に多大なるご尽力をいただいたイスラエル大使館、経済部の皆様、現地政府関係者の皆様、イスラエル企業関係者の皆様に、心から御礼申し上げる次第でございます。どうもありがとうございました。当センターとしても、今回、登壇いただいたイスラエル政府、企業の方々とのご縁を大切にして、ここ九州の地において、今後のイスラエルイノベーション事業をさらに進化させていくべく、支援活動を行ってまいりたいと思っておりますので、引き続きご協力を賜りますようお願い申し上げます。ご視聴いただいた団員の皆様には、お忙しいところ、2日間のミッションに参加いただき、本当にありがとうございました。これを機会にぜひイスラエルと連携した事業が実り多いものとなりますことを記念いたしております。この後予約いただきました企業様には個別商談会を準備しておりますので、有意義な商談となりますよう、活発な意見交換をお願い申し上げます。えー、皆様、ミッション団参加、本当にありがとうございました。これにて会談といたします。ありがとうございました。最後に皆様へアンケートのお願いです。本ウェビナー終了後にお知らせ画面の URL よりアンケートフォームへ移動できますので、ご協力をよろしくお願いいたします。なお、アンケートの最後に、昨日ご案内いたしましたイスラエル日本商工会議所会員企業との商談会申し込みフォームもございますのでよろしくお願いいたしますさて
昨日から2日間にわたり開催いたしましたイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションいかがでしたでしょうか本来であれば現地に赴き世界のス,トスタートアップ大国であるイスラエルの現状が直に感じていただきたいところでございましたが現在世界的に移動が困難な状況にあり今回ウェブミッションという形式での開催に至りましたイスラエル政府機関をはじめ商工会議所現地企業の皆様によるリアルタイムの情報がご参加の皆様方の今後の協業連携新事業展開にお役に立ちましたら幸いです以上をもちましてイスラエルイノベーション視察ウェブミッションを終了いたします長時間のご参加誠にありがとうございましたなおこの後18時からの個別商談会へお申し込みの皆様は終了後に事前にご連絡いたしました時間および URL にて商談会ブースへご入室くださいませありがとうございました。